What's up, everybody? It's A. Cole, the Culturepreneur, reporting on behalf of Coin Market Cap, and we're here at the Central Miami, where we're going to be talking to not only your favorite projects, but also some influencers out here that are going to teach you a little bit about the metaverse, a little bit about Web 3.0, a little bit about NFTs, and we're going to talk to it all. We're going to find out what everyone has to say. So stay tuned, get ready. We're going to go down a ride into the metaverse. So come on down with me, Eko. I'll see you guys in a bit. What is, is a way that you can explain, you know, what Web 3.0 is to the everyday average person in a simple way? I think uh, Jack Dorsey came up with a really elegant explanation of this um, when he was speaking at a summit earlier this year in the summer. He said that if Twitter, Facebook and YouTube were created today, they would be totally different companies because of Web 3. And that's because if you're financially incentivized uh, to grow the community. Like you actually own a piece of YouTube, you own a piece of Facebook. That's what Web3 is about, is people are uh, gain monetary value the larger the network grows. If we had that today, then all the social media companies in the world would not be relying on advertising revenue in order to monetize. They would rely on tokenization and that would change the algorithms, that would change the echo chambers, that would change a lot of the problems that we see in social media today because tokenization creates an entirely new form of monetization that enables everyday people like you and me to really participate in actually owning a piece of the internet like owning a piece of the stock market i love how you said that we're owning we're owning a part of the community the network rather than just being monet uh, being monetized by it right in your own words could you please define you know web 3.0 as if like you know you're speaking to a young child or so that anyone could understand got it got it so i'll just transform this question a bit i'll just yeah. define web 1.0 or we'll start with that so um you know, I'm a bit old, uh, so I have uh, seen uh, websites uh, which was built on yahoo.com or GeoCities. Uh, that was Web 1.0 or just to put it very simply, it was one way connection. So I would talk to a website, I would say, hey, can you give me more information about that website? And the website will reply back uh, with the uh, same information, no matter if I'm talking to them or no matter if Aaron is talking to it. That was Web 1.0. Uh, then came Web 2.0, wherein this connection got bidirectional. So, uh, for example, when I log into Twitter now, uh, the Twitter um, uh, server replies to me with my own feed. And when Aaron will do it, it will be a different feed. So, Web 2.0 is about um, uh, reacting. Like, I if I'm a user, I'm a different user than Aaron is, so I'll get a different feed. So Web 1.0 was static, Web 2.0 was dynamic, but with a server. Web 3.0 took it a little bit further. So with this Web 2.0, what we had was uh, this centralized server and it was a single point of failure. Uh, people realized very soon, like what happens if there's no server? Instead, there is a group of computers talking to each other and producing the same information out. And that essentially became Web 3.0. Uh, because there's no centralized point of failure and of course uh, information uh, is not susceptible to uh, damage because I will need uh, to change information on all these computers to basically change the information which is really not possible and that what makes Web 3.0 so versatile and so into blockchain and cryptocurrencies. <laughs> Yeah, wow. So we went, you guys, you got to pay attention to that. That was a full history lesson. We, we went from the, the 90s to the 2000s to the 2010s to now the 2020s, right? So the evolution of the internet has taken place at such a rapid pace. And, uh, you know, we might not be able to keep up with all of it, but the earlier you learn, the better, right? Because now you have an opportunity to not only interact with the with the web that, we, that we're normally used to on web 2.0, now you have a, t a chance to actually own part of the web and monetize uh, your content and everything on the web uh, using that way. What are some ways that like Web3 and DeFi 
uh, can be help uh, can help prevent uh, you know censorship and technocratic state control of information, ideas, and content um, using like you know DeFi and and uh, Web three. You know, this is really a great point, and it goes to the heart of decentralization, right? With any centralized company, you have a CEO, and when you have a CEO, you have a throat to choke, right? You can shut down a company, you can send all your lawyers, you can try to shut them down and say you're not of working, or you have to change certain things, or you have to censor a certain part of the internet in order to fit to our rules, right? In decentralized finance or in crypto in general, that can't happen because there is no central owner. It is democratized with that hundreds of thousands of users and everything is done through a pure democratic vote. And through that, you can't go to any one individual and say, stop that, because everything is literally done through group consensus and how things are approved. And through that way, it's beautiful and elegant because even if you tried to shut it down, you actually can't. You can't stop Bitcoin. Uh, you can't stop in the Terra ecosystem UST, a decentralized stablecoin. Anything that becomes decentralized, the only thing that stops it is how large the community is and how large the community grows. And that puts the power back into the people. Everything going on in crypto, you know, there's a huge trend going on. Everyone is looking to find out what the heck is going on with DAOs and what is a DAO and what do they necessarily do. So I'd just like to ask you, you know, what is a DAO? Like, how would you describe it in your own words? Got it. So DAO, guys, uh, it's essentially democracy. Uh, think about it uh, as a group of people coming together uh, to achieve a common goal or common vision. Uh, think about it like how trust operate in real world or how uh, a company operates in a real world. In a company, in real world, you have shares and whenever they want to pass on some decision that will be beneficial for their vision, uh, they have a shareholder meeting and everyone comes and votes and whenever that vote won, uh, whatever votes win, that proposal is activated. Uh, now that is uh, essentially what happens in a real world. Uh, with uh, shareholders and uh, you know companies when you take it to the digital world when you take it to the cryptocurrency world uh, this term is uh, replaced by DAO or digital autonomous organization now why autonomous because now we have uh, cryptocurrencies or tokens that we can utilize to automatically form that proposal and automatically pass it up and the DAOs which are formed, they basically work again on this common shared vision, uh, which might be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, solving environment problems or uh, funding public, uh, public goods or even, you know, aping a banana. Uh, it can be your choice. Uh, but yeah, you'll find uh, like minded people and you'll find this DAO that will work towards that vision and achieving that vision. So, yeah, yeah that, and that's the cool thing about DAOs. Like, it's like-minded people all across the world, right? Like, it doesn't matter. It's not limited to geography. You, you know, it could be people in U.S. It could be people in, in, in India. It could be people in the Caribbean. It could be people in South America, anywhere across the world, right? So it's just about like-minded individuals coming to serve a, a purpose. What do you see are some challenges uh, for like, you know, the metaverse going mainstream? Because, you know, with like uh, meta, for example, coming out, like, you know, some people might confuse the two. Right. So what would you say are some challenges for the mainstream audience to get uh, familiar with the metaverse? That's a great question, Aaron. Thanks. So some challenges I foresee with the mainstream adoption of NFT based economies. Um, well, First and foremost, user experience and accessibility and usability. So making it so anybody can sign up rapidly and easily and it's like a web 2.0 experience which a lot of folks are used to using where they sign in with like a pre-existing account or an email and password. That's super important just to bring in the masses because um, key management and blockchain security is difficult. And, you know, that's something you got to learn over time. So we need bridges to allow people to get in in a non-intimidating manner. Um, beyond that, it's an education piece as well, because if someone sees something flashy and fun, like maybe a meta product, they may just jump in and not ask deeper questions. So really, we're in a race against the clock to educate millions, hundreds of millions of people on why 
users and people need to own these metaverses rather than these companies. So yeah. those, those are big challenges. Education and accessibility, I'd say, are the biggest. So education is always key, especially in this space, uh, because now we have the opportunity, especially in cryptocurrency, we're front running the big companies, right? Like we're ahead of them. They're looking at us mm -hmm. kind of like saying, oh, uh, let's peek around the corner. What are they up to? And yeah. they're watching us because they, they really don't know what's going on, right? Like they're just, they're in a position to catch up. So uh, fishing expeditions, trying to drain our brains and figure out like how they can leverage it, you know? And that's validation at the end of the day, too. It's competition and it's validation. So it's a good sign, but we must stay vigilant. Yeah, it's a community thing. So that's the one thing about crypto, uh, whether it's NFTs, DeFi, or just normal cryptocurrency assets, community is everything. Community over clout, right? Uh, what do you see are some of the challenges for communicating the value of the metaverse to the average individual? I think uh, communication is so important in crypto in general is taking something very abstract where it's the intersection of everything people don't understand about the internet with everything people don't understand about money, right? And then putting it all together and explaining it. So when it comes to the metaverse, I don't even say want to use the word metaverse. I just want to say, what is your digital profile like? And how do you understand that? Metaverse is just like a, a catchphrase, a sexy term, especially for investors, like big data or machine learning or whatever, right? So it's just like, you know, what, how, all, people don't care about terminology. They only care about how it affects them in their daily life. How does it affect their grocery shopping? How does it affect their spending? How does it affect their time with the people they love? And you have to talk to them on those terms, not using crypto terms. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Uh, basically translating our, you know, they look at it as fancy mumbo jumbo words. It's, it's a language that they haven't learned yet. So using their words, that, that's great. That's a great advice, honestly speaking. So to the viewers at home, you know, you want to get your friends, your grandmas, your cousins onto crypto, you know, start communicating in the language they, they understand, right? So uh, it's all about communication. So. What do you think about this? Do you believe that one company can own the metaverse? Why or why not? Oh, I think that's a dangerous road, actually. So <clears throat> to me, metaverses, by definition, have to be open access and available for anyone. Equal opportunity is what we're trying to create with this movement. So if we allow one company like Meta or any other large game company to monopolize a metaverse, it really just is them recreating their same walled garden that they may already have for their business model in this new form. And to me, it's almost a form of trickery. So um, I don't believe that metaverses should be closed. And um, really the point, like you brought up William Quigley, the co-founder of Wax. He makes a really good point that the tech lords are feudal lords or the tech companies are feudal lords and they essentially can ban everyone arbitrarily or you know they can figure out reasons to basically kick you off their platform the point of all this metaverse stuff is to prevent that from being possible to put the ownership of the economy in the users hands so basically i don't think one company should own a metaverse i don't think we should allow them to co-opt that term either Okay, uh, and I like that, that that you said that as well too. Um, the the co-opting of the term is a uh, is a very sly way uh, of of getting people to think that the metaverse is them, right? So that's a that's a good way to put it. Uh, what would you say are some of the you know, the current issues that everyday average person faces when getting onboarded into DeFi? Got it. So uh, DeFi or decentralized finance, uh, while very cool and while very innovative, the major, major problem which we have seen users face is, uh, I mean, communication. Uh, when you are going into DeFi and its user experience as well, like just think about it, uh, you are into DeFi, you take a loan, it gets liquidated, you are not uh, able to know about it. And uh, when you are into Uniswap or into trading, again, uh, if you are forming an LP pool, that LP pool range will fall out 
and you won't get to notify about it or get to know about it well the good thing is that this these problems they are now going to become a problem of the past very soon because whether it's uniswap whether it's aave whether it's makerdao whether it's uh, uh, uh truefi i mean or alpha homara we are working we at tpns are working with all of these projects and we are essentially delivering these communication uh, back to the users yeah communication is key and uh, especially when it comes to like you know building communities in crypto uh, if you don't communicate uh, the community has a big problem with that right so that can solve a lot of problems there with communication what are what are some uh, some challenges that you know the everyday average person faces when getting onboarded into defi the biggest challenge honestly right is like one of the biggest challenges is what purpose does defi serve and how do you actually navigate that world defi is not easy to navigate it's not like it's not user friendly the risks aren't always clear you know like even if you see like an 80000% apy the question is is like what is your apy coming in is it a token that's value is going to hold or is it going to collapse because then it's like you didn't actually get value there or like are any of the tokens that you're holding like what's the underlying value and how does that overall work so that's not always clear the other piece too is you know thinking about like what use case does defi serve for the everyday person you know like you have these things around apy and returns and stuff like that but you know like so also you know like borrowing and lending like can that be used for an everyday purpose or not really so you know an example is let's take something like ave which is like your biggest like borrow like one of your biggest borrowing and lending protocols but if i want to borrow anything on ave i have to post more collateral than i actually have so it means you know for an everyday user like when we think of traditional retail market borrowing and lending it's not really possible uh and so i think that's like another piece to think about the other really really challenging piece for an everyday person is the on ramp and off ramp right like going from crypto to fiat back to crypto that is usually one of the biggest challenges especially in emerging markets where you know like we can say oh it'd be great like you know your financial infrastructure like the financial infrastructure in a country or in a region is not particularly strong crypto can help the problem is how do people actually get access to crypto and how do people go from crypto to real world very very difficult and that is something that i think is going to take a lot more work that we're going to have to spend a lot more time actively and physically really going to those markets and building out